everybody. Right. Everybody noticed the silence, realizing that session is a good start. Welcome to the uh, final afternoon session. Um, in this session, we are going to have um, two standard presentations and then what I call a storm session because there are going to be uh, five lightning talks <laughs> before end of the day. So um, let's get started. And we have three here. Ravi uh, talking to us about the maritime geospatial analytics for supply chain transport policy. Thank you. <laughs> It's not a very short title, very unwieldy. Um, but yeah, hello everybody, I'm Shrif. I work for Te Malatuaka, which is a Ministry of Transport in Wellington. And um, yeah, so this, pro this talk is probably a little out of the standard set of talks that usually come in FOS4G, but you learn something different, I hope. And yeah, please feel free to ask questions if things don't make sense. This is the first time I'm giving a talk like this, so it's an experiment for me too. Um, yeah, so the topics that we'll cover today are, um, yeah, what is geospatial analytics, if you're unfamiliar? Um, what is policy? Which is not always very easy to explain, and I've certainly struggled trying to understand it myself. Um, and of course, the most important thing is how do you actually use analytics for policy making? And I'll share a um, particular use case that I've been working on with a colleague of mine um, who is in the supply chain team. Cool. Uh, geospatial analytics. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, it's a common enough word that most people kind of know it has something to do with data, but really a lot of analytics is computational analysis, which you frequently do with code. You don't have to, but it's often the case. Um, and it's, yeah, just trying to find meaningful patterns of data, and often it is also the interpretation and communication of that to business users such that they can make more effective decisions. Um, because I guess without data and finding useful patterns, they're just kind of using experience and intuition. Analytics is actually a bit of an umbrella term. It's often synonymous with data science, but not necessarily. So just to give you an overview, these are all the kinds of different domains that are often considered analytics. And depending on where you are, they may have one or more of these domains that they have in a team of analytics people or in an organization which is devoted to analytics. So there's things like statistical modeling, um, machine learning, but you can also have simulations that are considered analytics. And of course, um, data analysis, which is like descriptive statistics and visualizations through to complicated deep learning things. Sometimes people who um, do sort of more business intelligence side, so they're producing reports and dashboards, are also sort of incorporated into analytics teams. So it's not very clear what analytics might be because it is an umbrella term. Um, but in this talk, I'll actually be sort of using more of a data science um, lens on analytics. So it's a little bit more around algorithms and statistical analyses to process um, big data. So yeah, so geospatial analytics, really, for me, the power is that it's not just processing geospatial information, but it's processing data that has geospatial attributes, but it can also have any of these other attributes as well. So you can have the same data point enriched with um, spatial coordinates, but also numeric characteristics, categorical characteristics, and of course, temporal characteristics. And you can bring them all together and generate a lot of useful insight. And the key here that really makes geospatial analytics quite cool are tools that operate across all of these different data types um, such that you can find useful patterns. And hopefully you'll see an example where you have spatial patterns as well as um, temporal patterns in some of the use case I showed later. We're in FOS4G, and so why would I be talking about geospatial analytics? And really it's because I think FOS truly enables geospatial analytics. Um, in languages like R and Python, you've got the sort of standard data science packages that we've already heard about previously, things like pandas for Python, and in R it's a package called dplyr. They are very easily extendable um, to spatial data, so the data frame uh, object is very easily able to incorporate um, line geometries, point geometries, point geomet uh, polygon geometries, and the same kind of algorithms that you might be running if you didn't have geospatial data, you can actually just extend to when you have spatial enrichment. 
And um, pandas and geopandas just work very seamlessly together. And the same thing is true with SF, which is a R package for um, managing spatial geometries. And what's really powerful about um, these tools is that if you are a data scientist, um, it's very easy for you to just bring in geospatial data science as just like you know another thing that you do. And so the entry for doing spatial analytics is very low, especially if you come from this sort of coding background using R or Python. And I'm sure it's the same in um, languages like Julia and others. Um, in transport, there's a bit of a paradigm shift that's happening um, through Phos4G. And I find this really exciting, so I wanted to share just some of the cool packages that certainly catch my eye, but there's plenty more available. Um, so they're really disrupting things like transport modeling, um, you know, running big simulations, um, also doing mapping. Um, these packages here are, the bottom ones are all R, and the top are different languages. So AB Street is actually an amazing project. It's written in Rust, and um, you should check it out. So you basically can run an AB um, test on the street, on your street in a city. So you can say, what if I change the street to have more cycle lanes? What will happen um, to traffic volumes and throughputs and so on? So it allows you to play with different scenarios in the sort of urbanism context. And you can actually download AB Street very easily and just like create scenarios for your own city. Um, they have some available online for like London and things like that. Matsum is this incredibly massive package. It's a bit of a behemoth, but it's really powerful. So it allows you to run agent-based simulations um, for transport. So it's multimodal. Um, you can have um, public transport, cars. Um, you can also have freight. And all of these um, vehicles are basically run by agents. And these agents, agents can make choices. So if you say, I'm going to chuck a congestion charge in this area, you can actually see how agents will re respond through the simulation. And so this is a fully open source package. Um, it's been developed for years and it's used by a lot of regions and cities in Europe in particular, and it's increasingly um, being used all over the world to um, replace otherwise quite expensive transport modeling software, which makes crappy assumptions. Um, OSMNX is a Python package which allows you to do some really powerful network analysis on street networks. Um, and it allows you to understand how urban structure is um, in a particular area. How can you get um, between cities because of the street layouts? It allows you to do quite a lot of detailed um, analysis in where you live. Um, like I'm not really explaining it very well, but just check out the site. <laughs> um, the bottom three packages are all in R. So SF Networks is the equivalent of OSM and X for, for R. But the power of SF networks is you can do network analysis on any shape file. So I've used it to look at um, rail networks and connectivity in rail. Um, whilst OSM and X, if you don't have a very good shape file through OSM, it kind of you can't import a shape file and just use it. Um, ST Planner and R5R are quite awesome for transport planners. Um, ST Planner does. Um, origin destination matrices routing onto street networks um, by any type of mode. And R5R is very dynamic. It allows you to do um, routing, but each trip can have multiple legs with different modes. So if you're in transport, these are really cool tools. And if you're not in transport, check them out anyway. So what is policy making? But first, we need to actually try and understand what the role of government is. It took me a really long time to try and find a relatively succinct description of why governments exist. They really exist to do, deal with two functions, um, to sort of deal with market failures, and there's many different types of market failures, and to deal with equity in terms of the distribution of resources, so often the result of market failures. Simplistically, they have only two interventions available to them. And this is being crude just to make a point. I'm not, I work for government, I'm not trying to say that they're, they're evil. Um, they, can, they can sort of make you change your behavior. Um, and they do that in a number of different ways, including regulation. Um, obviously, they collect tax in most liberal economies. Um, and then they spend. They spend to provide public services and to provide subsidies. So there's sort of two main branches of interventions. There's a lot of nuance, as one can imagine, within each of them. But just for a high level view, that's what they do. Policy is the design of government intervention. So this is what policymakers do. They try and figure out, OK, 
Are there any problems? And often it's a market failure. They try and go through a cycle um, to figure out what the issues are to actually try and understand what the instruments they can use to address these issues. And those are things like, should we spend more? Um, should we have more regulation and so on? And then they go through extensive consultation at several points in the cycle before they actually make a decision on what policy option they're gonna implement. And once they do that, they have to evaluate the policy and usually there'll be some problem and then they have to go through the cycle again. Um, and analytics plays, several, um, plays a role in several of these. Um, points of the cycle. I'm going to focus a little bit more, um, the use case I'll have is going to be in the very first part, actually helping policymakers identifying issues and providing enough contextual information so that they don't just rely on what people are telling them, but they have some more objective sources of um, insight as well. Why would you want to use data in policy? Well, if you don't have evidence, through information or through research. It effectively is just guesswork and opinions. And that's being extreme, but you know, you, if you don't have a robust reason for providing a rationale for why you're doing this particular policy, then you can't actually evaluate you know, whether there was a better choice that you could have gone through. So policymakers really need the appropriate information and that's where the analysts come in and they need relevant knowledge and that's usually supported through academic research. But as you can imagine, because analysts and policymakers speak very different languages, um, our interactions are a work in progress. Um, most analysts that I know at least have very little understanding of policy. It's usually because they don't come from a policy background. Um, I don't think I know anybody that has done policy and then moved into analytics. I hope to meet one someday. Um, but so far, yeah, they come from technical disciplines and they struggle to understand what policymakers are all about and what policy really is. Likewise, policymakers don't really understand um, a lot of the time the value of analytics and um, quantitative information. I've had many policymakers tell me, oh, I'm not a numbers person, I'm a words person. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I can tell you about numbers and words. It's not about, it's just about using good evidence. Um, and so, you know, it can be, you know, just two people just standing there looking at each other, going, hmm, how do we work together? And I realize my GIFs aren't working, it's really sad. Oh, oh this one is though. Um, so, to bring evidence into policy making, you know, somebody has to blink first or make the first move. And in my experience so far, it really is the analyst because policy makers have spent a long time just doing what they do best, which is you know, consulting extensively with a diverse set of stakeholders to understand what the issues are, succinctly summarizing them, and then working through the cycle themselves. That often gives you enough information, but you know, there, there's a lot of um, bias in those in, 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 in that they will also gain as a result. So analysts need to just engage with policymakers. They need to ask questions, because if you don't know what they are dealing with, then you don't really know how to help them. You need to learn the domain, and there is a lot, unfortunately, to learn. But what I find the most useful are the sort of last bits, which is you need to actually give them something to play with and you need to make it accessible. Because if you don't allow, if you don't let them know what you can do with data, what information you can mine from it, they won't really know even where to begin to talk to you. So you need to make the analyses accessible. You need to have pretty pictures, but you also need to have good explanations of what they mean and what the takeaway messages are. Just sharing, discussing, and if it doesn't work the first time, and it will not work the first time, just keep repeating it, keep bothering them, and you know, eventually they will actually start conversations with you, and you'll get to a point where you can work productively together. So, very brief transport story. I'm not sure I'll have tons of time to go into detail, um, so it's very high level. Um, feel free to ask questions after. So yeah, so in transport policy, there's a really nice um, schematic here of a framework a colleague of mine had drawn, and this is more focused on the sort of um, identifying market failure um, part of what government does. So yeah, in the case of transport, we have things like freight, which is a whole stream of work, and we obviously have personal travel, like what you and I do every day. Um, and it's usually trying to understand where exactly are the problems, and then this is just a summary of like actually a policymaker going through and understanding, okay, are the markets working? And this is where they'll go through an extensive consultation process with several players in the sector and try and understand, yes, 
they are working, but here is where they're not, or definitely not working at all. Um, and then they will start going through um, what can they actually do in terms of de generating policy to meet certain objectives that they have as a ministry, or the minister has got certain objectives they want to fulfill. And then finally, they'll have policies that they've developed, and then they'll figure out an evaluation. This is just a summary of what they will do going from top to down of the policy cycle done linearly. Um, but, you know, if you want to understand how markets are working, you're going to talk to people, of course. But people will not give you unbiased information, <laughs> especially when things are not working well. There's often a lot of pain, and the sort of negative experiences get quite amplified, and good policymakers can certainly sift through it and come up with a very good description of what bits are working and what are not. But oftentimes, they miss the fact that you can have sort of dovetailing information from quantitative sources that can really enrich their understanding. So they can say, okay, this person's complaining about certain issues in container shipping, but here's the information that I have from data sources of regular container ship schedules. Am I actually seeing where the problems are, or is it only in particular cases that these problems are arising? So giving sort of additional information to policymakers really immensely lifts them in understanding how the system is working and if there are market failures, where to hone in on because just listening to people may not always help. So that's the sort of thing that I've been working on with colleagues of mine in the supply chain team. So we're focusing largely on um, freight and specifically maritime freight. And really the question is, you know, are things working well? Because, as we all know, we had a lot of issues through the COVID pandemic, and we continue to have issues. We've not really come out of the pandemic by any means. And there were a lot of, um, of course, issues with uh, supply chains being blocked, being delayed. And it raised questions around how resilient are our trade routes and how resilient is our connectivity. So this is like bigger questions that we can answer in one talk, but these were the starting points for why, for actually working through some analyses that can bring more insight for the policymakers. So simple questions like, where are ships going? What routes do they take? How long do routes take? And are ships doing the same kinds of routes? And these seem like very trivial questions, but a lot of time when people are complaining, you need to know that actually there are ships that are consistently not doing um, good enough routes that are satisfying the trade requirements for New Zealand. So simple questions do need to be addressed first. So to sort of do all of this at MOT, we had to invest in um, understanding a new data source. We'd never actually used um, ship movement data before. And I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but um, AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. It's a little um, transponder that is on all big ships. They are required to have one on board. And it frequently just pings information about who it is, the name of the ship, usually some identifier, where it is, so the spatial coordinates and the timestamp. Um, so you get these really detailed movement tracks for every ship for you know every time they're at sea and actually even when they're anchored at port. So if you're really into movement analytics and knowing where the ships are going, so you're interested more in sort of geospatial resilience and potentially ships going through um, parts of maritime waters around conflict zones and so on, so you would actually get this raw um, spatial spatiotemporal information. But what we were really interested in is just routes that ships were doing at a fairly high level, which is just the ports that they visited and when they visited the port and how long they were at the port. So we processed, we got processed data off um, ship movements through a company called Sarah, um, and then just wrote a whole series of simple algorithms to identify, um, you know, uh, I guess classify what ships are doing. And you can see that as routes, voyages, and schedules. And we also started doing some simple connectivity analyses. So if a ship moves between ports, it means that it's actually connecting those ports together and you can actually do a lot of network analysis from that information. So these are my ggplot2 maps. I know it's Pete who was talking about ggplot and maps. So don't judge the maps, but I feel like this is very simple code to write it. So I, I still use it. Um, so this is a whole series of different voyages done by a ship called MSC Alabama, and she moves between New Zealand, Australia, and Southeast Asia, which is a very common trade route. And here, a route 
has been identified by the maritime seaboards the ship is connecting. So here it's, I've just sort of shortened it to Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. And what you can see is the ship on every single voyage, she does just slight variations of the route because you can see the patterns of the arcs kind of changing slightly. There's a different ship called the Northern Guild. And for a certain part of the year, this is 2021, she was just going between Australia, New Zealand, and East Asia. Here it was sort of the east coast of China. But at some point decided to just say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that anymore and go between Australia and New Zealand and then decide to go between Australia, New Zealand, and North America. And some of these analyses are really interesting because you need to do this level, you need to divide the information this way before you can actually give the policymakers, I guess, a more high level um, summary. And that was this. Um, here, so things, the value of geospatial data science with spatial data and temporal data. So you've got, um, you're basically building a ship schedule over the year of what different ships are doing. Um, so here I've tried to look at ships that have at some point in the year connected Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia. And the blocks are when they're actually on the voyage, when it's a blank point. They're probably berthed at a port or maybe they're stopped somewhere else. And you can see that, you know, the ships that do Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia routes, if they do any other type of uh, voyage, it's just a combination of them. So either they miss out the Australian ports or they, um, in the case of the blue voyages, they've sort of added um, East Asia ports as well. And if we look at ships that do trans-Tasman, so on the left-hand side, that's just Australia and New Zealand, um, you can see that there's very few ships that just do that consistently all year round. Um, and if you see the right, that's filling up with the, all the other types of voyages that they do, you're actually seeing that a lot of ships that do trans-Tasman voyages actually go all the way to the US. And this is really useful information for the policymakers because they wanted to understand if there were issues happening, say, at the American ports, what other types of um, routes would it affect, and in this case, any issues in North American ports will definitely be affecting trans-Tasman voyages. And finally, we started doing sort of connectivity networks. So these are, if any port is connected, we connect the countries of the ports together. And these just very simple sort of eye candy is actually clusters of countries that are best connected through ship movements. Um, there's a lot more you can do with it, but there's not enough time to go into that. So we'll just leave you um, with this pretty picture. But yeah, so you basically see um, connections between um, Australia, New Zealand, and the Southeast Asian countries, um, the US and the um, Caribbean countries, and you've got East Asia and Oceania connected more strongly together. Super quickly, these are the tools that I used. Um, DeepIR and SF for data processing, ggplot2 for visualization, and um, what is cool is that you can use Quarto for creating uh, reproducible outputs, which hopefully if I click on this, I'll be able to just take you to the site. Yep, so this is a whole web page, website, oh, oh, where is my mouse? Um, where the analyst could actually get a lot more detail um, with a write-up of what the analysis is actually showing them. So this was the way to actually make the analyses accessible in any updates. They don't have to change anything. They just go to the same link and they get the latest information. That's it. Thank you. So we have um, time for one question.